Hi, this is Jack from Physiology Zone and in this second part on skeletal muscle we're going to be focusing on the neuromuscular junction. So this is all about how the action potential reaches and innovates the muscle and allowing it to contract. Then in the subsequent episode we're going to concentrate on contraction. So over the next two episodes we'll cover the excitation contraction coupling. So firstly we're going to look at the motor neuron and then we're going to look at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so the action potential that allows voluntary muscle contraction begins in the motor cortex of your brain. And just as a side note, reflexes which cause muscle contraction are automatic and they occur at the level of the spinal cord. So with voluntary muscle contraction, the action potential is relayed down from the brain through the spinal cord via some nerve fibers called tracts then from the spinal cord the impulse is relayed to the muscle through a motor neuron. The motor neuron is made up of a cell body which is in the spinal cord and then an axon. And it's worth knowing that with many other motor neurons and sensory neurons this creates a nerve and in this case this would be the musculocutaneous nerve which is the nerve that innervates our biceps muscle. So the action potential flows down the motor neuron axon to the skeletal muscle and at the level of the muscle fibers the motor neuron branches extensively into what's called the axon terminals and from here it innervates our muscles. So now let's look at the part where the motor neuron branches onto the muscle fibers. So on screen is just a zoomed in version of where the axon actually branches onto our muscle fibers. So to illustrate what we're looking at, we have the axon, then we have the muscle fibers. So we've got three of them on the screen. Now it's also worth remembering that all motor neuron axons are wrapped in myelin sheath, which allows saltatory conduction. And we will cover much more about that in the neurology module, but simply it allows the conduction to happen quickly. So then, as we said, the axon splits into the axon terminals and you have one axon terminal that goes to one muscle fiber. And at the end of each of these is the synaptic end bulb or bouton. And each synaptic end bulb attaches to the center of one skeletal muscle fiber. And note that that is important because it allows the whole muscle fiber to receive the action potential and contract almost simultaneously. And remember that the synaptic end bulb is connecting with the cell membrane of the muscle fiber, which is called the sarcolemma. And it's the communication between these two structures that's the site of the most extensively studied synapse called the neuromuscular junction. So now let's take a look at the components of this neuromuscular junction. So at the top we have the neuron synaptic end bulb and this contains fluid called cytosol and vesicles which contain acetylcholine. On its borders we also have some calcium channels. Then we have the synaptic cleft which contains interstitial fluid and at the bottom we have the muscle fibers sarcolemma which is its cell membrane and note that this is often referred to as the motor end plate. Beneath the sarcolemma, we have the cytosol of the muscle fiber, which is called sarcoplasm. So the processes that occur at the neuromuscular junction to create a muscle action potential and then subsequent contraction can be split into five parts and I've tried to simplify these whilst retaining the important points. So firstly, you get the action potential and that runs through the motor neuron, reaching the synapse M bulb, causing depolarization. That depolarization causes an opening of the calcium channels and an influx of calcium into the synaptic end bulb. This influx of calcium leads to the vesicles fusing and then releasing their contents, which is acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft, and that is called exocytosis. So the next bit is best thought of in terms of locks and keys. So on the motor end plate, the sarcolemma, there are specialized nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are the locks. And then we have the acetylcholine, which are the keys. 
and when two molecules of acetylcholine bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, it causes a conformational change in the structure of that receptor. And if you will, it's akin to a key opening the lock. And now that that receptor is unlocked, it opens a little like a door, but it's only selective to sodium and potassium ions. So sodium is the most abundant extracellular cation, whereas potassium is the most abundant intracellular cation. Now, overall, we have a lot more sodium than we do potassium. So sodium, as we said, is extracellular, and it's sitting in that synaptic cleft. And that's because that contains interstitial fluid, which is part of the extracellular component of our body. So because there's loads of sodium ions in the interstitial fluid, it flows from here down its concentration or electrochemical gradient across the motor end plate and into the muscle fiber. And whilst some potassium does leak out of the channel down its own concentration gradient, the driving force of sodium to come in far outweighs any efflux of potassium. So therefore, the flow of sodium into the muscle fiber causes a change in the membrane potential. So the charge of the outside versus the inside of the muscle fiber. And that change in membrane potential triggers a depolarization that's called the end plate potential within the sarcolemma or the motor end plate. So the next bit is taking a closer look at how the action potential gets from that sarcolemma depolarization right down to the muscle fiber's center to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and causing calcium release. So what we're going to do here is blow up the sarcolemma in terms of size. And then we, whilst we take a closer look at that, let's look at where the action potential goes. So it runs down the sarcolemma. And then as we said in the previous tutorial, it goes down through the T tubules and up here to the triad zone. So this causes a release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But now let's look in more detail at what occurs at the triad zone to allow this to happen. So on screen, we have a zoomed version of the myofibril with the T tubule, terminal cisternae and the sarcoplasmic reticulum with lots of calcium in it. But we also have these two receptors. Firstly, we have a dihydropyridine receptor on the T-tubule, and this is made up of a tetrad, so meaning four L-type calcium channels. We also have a ryanodine receptor, which is on the terminal cisterna, and this is made up of a calcium release channel with four foot processes. So when the action potential arrives into the T-tubule, it causes a conformational change in this dihydropyridine receptor. And this creates a mechanical coupling between the four L-type calcium channels on the dihydropyridine receptor and the four foot processes of the calcium release channel, which is on the ryanodine receptor. This mechanical coupling causes a conformational change in the calcium release channels, and that then allows the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then subsequently, that moves into the sarcoplasm. So the movement of that calcium into the sarcoplasm activates then troponin C on the tropomyosin troponin complex, and that leads to muscle contraction. And we're going to look at that in far more detail in the next tutorial. And as an aside, and for interest, although we are stressing the importance of the mechanical coupling to create calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there does also exist a process that's known as calcium-induced calcium release, whereby the calcium which has already been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum can itself activate the ryanodine receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum and lead to further calcium release. And in the 1970s, we thought this was the primary reason for skeletal muscle contraction. But now we feel that this is more of a contributory process that occurs in skeletal muscle. And it's much more important in actual fact in cardiac muscle, which we'll visit in a later tutorial. So finally, we have the termination of the acetylcholine activity. So acetylcholine's effect of producing this muscle fiber action potential and subsequent contraction only lasts briefly due to the presence of the enzyme acetylcholine esterase within the synaptic cleft. 
and this enzyme breaks down acetylcholine into acetyl and choline, which are unable to independently activate the acetylcholine receptor. And as an extra note, acetylcholine is recreated within the synaptic embulb from acetyl-coenzyme A and choline, and that process is catalyzed by the enzyme choline acetyltransferase. So if you get another action potential that reaches the neuromuscular junction, then these five steps just repeat themselves. So that's everything that I wanted to go through in this tutorial. And so just to recap what we've gone through, we looked at the motor neuron and we saw how it has a cell body, an axon, it then branches into the axon terminals and ends at the synaptic embolb, which meets with the sarcolemma. And where those two structures meet, that's the site of the neuromuscular junction. We learned about the important five steps in the transmission of a neuromuscular signal, and that was through calcium release, within the synaptic embulb that causes exocytosis of that acetylcholine and that then activates those acetylcholine receptors which is on the sarcolemma. Then you get the sarcolemma depolarizing which it sends all the way down into the sarcoplasmic reticulum where you get that mechanical coupling. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium and then we ultimately get termination of the acetylcholine because it's broken down. But if we get another action potential, this whole process just repeats itself. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next tutorial where we go through contraction of skeletal muscle.